Thanks for coming. Um, this is going to be a presentation on the introduction to Vault. I've already had a few questions, so we are talking about uh, the HashiCorp product called Vault. Uh, and before I start talking about Vault, I'm going to take a step back and talk a little about uh, distributed systems and specifically about configuration of distributed systems. So in the last 20 years, the way the web works has changed from end to end. Uh, hardware has changed, software has changed, networking has changed, the service providers we have uh, have changed. And therefore the way that we uh, create applications has changed, the way that we deploy those applications has changed, uh, and the way that we need to configure those applications uh, at runtime has also changed. These have all changed drastically. So if we look at uh, ways that we use, that we still use today to uh, to configure applications at runtime. Um, there are three big categories that I want to quickly touch on. Uh, we'll start with configuration management. So in configuration management, you have these systems that when you want to deploy uh, a server or when you want to deploy an application that's running on the server, uh, you have the central system or the central set of rules uh, that can either work with push or pull. Uh, and all the rules that you have for the server and all the configuration of the server and the application, everything will be synced from this central storage place to the server. And you have examples of, of uh, those kind of tools. You have, you have Ansible, Chef, and Puppet. Uh, there are a lot of others, but those are like three of the big ones. Uh, and the, it, it has advantages and disadvantages. The big, uh, the, the, Big disadvantage is that not every system today, especially the, the, the lean, mean, all the serverless stuff and all the container stuff, it doesn't work so so well with these systems because these systems were made to, to administrate uh, servers or at least operating systems, uh, and it doesn't work so well. Um, but the idea is that when, when you run the system, it'll either write a local file or it'll populate your environment or whatever, you want it to do, and that's how your application, when it starts up, will read whatever was written by the configuration management system, and it'll work. Another way of doing it, a very old school way of doing it, is a shared file system, right? The classic example for that is NFS. That might be the one thing that hasn't changed in like the last 20 years, that there are still applications that do that. Um, and I, I also put S3, I kind of put S3 in between the KV data stores and the shared file systems, because it's it's really a KV data store, but most people consider it a shared file system for some reason, so I left it in the middle. Um, I'm going to come back to them. I'm going to go to the KV data stores, and I'm going to come back to the, to, the, to the shared file systems, what's wrong with them, and we'll start moving forward. Uh, the, with a KV data store, you don't even have file. There, there is no idea of a static file. There's nothing that's actually being read from a disk, per se, but rather, uh, your application, when it starts up, is going to connect to uh, some remote database. Uh, usually, it's like an in-memory uh, database, so that it's uh, that it's optimized to be really, really low latency. So examples of that are Redis or uh, etcd or console, which is uh, also a HashiCorp product. Um, and KV Data Store is exactly what it says. So instead of reading a configuration file, you're going to go over a set of keys that the application knows up front. Uh, possibly not even at startup, possibly just as it's needed for the first time, and it'll say, hey, what's the database host? What's the database port? What's the database user? What's the database password? And for each, uh, for each key, it'll get an answer back from the system. Um, the problem with the, 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 the big advantage of these uh, KV data stores is that they're very, uh, they're optimized to be low latency. They're very optimized for uh, massively distributed applications. They know how to do replication. They know how to do high availability. Um, one, of the, one of the classic examples of, of uh, problems or anti-patterns in doing a remote configuration, uh, and this is what I was talking about earlier with, uh, with shared file systems, is if you, do, if, if you have like a single point of truth for all of your configuration, like an NFS server, uh, and you need to read that at startup, and when your application starts up, you can't access that because in that second it was down or unresponsive or whatnot. You can get into a loop. You can end up going nowhere. Uh, and applications can cycle and go out of control. And it's a big problem. Uh, and when these KV data stores were, were built in the last, I'd say, five years uh, for the most sake, um, 
we, we were already in the, at the cusp of virtualization. We already had these massive public clouds where you could have uh, guest operating systems, virtualized systems, uh, massively scattered all over the world, moving an application could go uh, up in one and down in the other and up in a third one. Uh, so these KV data stores were really tooled for that. Uh, and they continue to meet the needs today, even with serverless, even with containers, even as things get leaner and meaner and, uh, uh, and go all over. But, um, but you have other problems. You have security problems. And this is all good when we're talking about uh, storing plain text things, configuration things, uh, like uh, database hosts. But what happens when we're talking about credentials, usernames, passwords, uh, secret keys? How do we store those? All these... Uh, all these three categories have their own sets of problems. With the KV data stores, uh, you often have problems in, in the security model of the KV database itself in that uh, it's very hard to segment uh, what users can access which keys. So very often, everyone will be able to have global read of all the secrets in the system as long as they can connect to it. You also have a problem of uh, security at rest, the backend uh, store of this. Um, even if the front end is cached in RAM, you're not going to want to use any system that's not backed by disk in case this thing goes down. Um, and then how is that encrypted? Well, in most cases it's not. Uh, the middle, uh, the shared file systems have better support for, that, for both of those. Uh, with shared file systems, you have users and groups on NFS. You have the same kind of thing with F3 or some other hosted uh, file system. Uh, but it's really a pain in the ass to configure and set up. Uh, and you don't always know if you can encrypt the, the back end. Um, the configuration management usually would take care of both of those. The configuration management know uh, what secrets are. Uh, you have these ideas of encrypted data bags uh, in, in Chef and you have uh, uh, Ansible Vault. You have tools for storing the secrets, but you have to be okay with, uh, with using uh, configuration management to manage everything about your application to push changes. Not every application today is going to be that friendly uh, with that kind of setup. Um, and in all these cases, you have other uh, limitations. You have uh, static secrets. That means you have use, uh, the secrets that you store here are accessible and identical for any uh, user or device that wants to access it. So the database, the application database user is usually going to be the same username and password for most of the components uh, in your application. And what happens if someone hacks into your database and you, you, could, you could see that it was the application user? You might even see what IP it came from. You don't really know how the, how the, the password was, or username was leaked. And when you're trying to do a postmortem of, of a problem, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, on that small introduction, uh, we're going to introduce HashiCorp Vault. Vault, uh, their one-liner is that Vault is, I quote, a tool to securely accessing secrets. Uh, Vault has two editions. Uh, there's an open source edition, which is what I'm mainly going to focus on. There's a commercial edition that has a lot of other uh, fun stuff that big enterprises like to do if they want to spend the money on it. And before, before we go into how it works, I want to talk about some core concepts. So the first core concept we said uh, is a secret. We said that Vault is a tool for managing secrets. I'm getting a new microphone. I'm so excited. Oh, okay, not yet. So what's a secret? A secret is anything you want to tightly control access to, such as API keys, password certificates, and more. Uh, Vault, I'm going to quote again from their website, Vault provides a unified interface to any secret while providing tight access control and reporting a detailed audit log. That was a long, complicated sentence. Let's break it down. Vault provides a unified interface. A unified interface, Vault is itself a REST API. Uh, once, once you know how your uh, secrets are stored, where they're stored in, the, in the, uh, the URI scheme, the way to access secrets is really the same for any type of secret. It's always going to be a REST call. That's a unified interface to any secret. We're going to talk about the different kinds of secrets that can be stored in Vault a little bit later while providing tight access control. Access control is a first class citizen in Vault. Um, every resource has an ACL protect, or one or more ACLs protecting it, defining what types of user Touch devices. Can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. Woo! 
Maintenance guys, it's my new hero. So, where was I? Access control. We talk about it. everything has its own ACL. All is good there. And recording a detailed audit log for all the wonderful security people here. You hear audit log and you sigh with relief. You can figure out what happened later. Another core concept I want to talk about are leases. Leases are a very uh, central concept inside Vault. Uh, every entity that is returned uh, by, by a Vault call is attached to a lease. Uh, a lease has a TTL on it, and a TTL can be extended or revoked. Leases are audited. Uh, audit, audit and revocation and lease rolling are first class citizens in Vault. Leases can be chained, which means that you could have a lease for one kind of uh, data that requests another type of data, and if the first lease expires, it'll, everything underneath it will also be expired. Um, so it, we'll see later, we're going to come back to these concepts and see how that makes life easy. Um, does anyone know what this is? Oh yeah, one time pad. Um, one time pads back in, I guess, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, even today, one time pads are like the holy grail of cryptography because they're hypothetical, but in theory, they're completely random, they're completely unique, and they're completely trusted. If you catch, if you catch an encrypted message uh, and you don't have the cipher for that specific message, uh, there's nothing you can do with it. If you catch a message and you know the plain text for a message, it still won't help you get the, the decryption of it. There's no such thing as a, a replay attack. There's, you can't do it. Every message, the way it works is you have two sets of pads, one to encrypt the data, one to decrypt the data. The pads are physically distributed to the right people. There are, in practice, never more than two copies of a pad, of a cipher on a pad. And therefore, unless you actually get a message that you know is routed to, and the pad that it's routed to, you can't break into it. Um, why am I bringing up one-time pads? The same idea really uh, applies in uh, in security and, and, uh, and access control uh, and Vault, uh, Vault has this concept of using ephemeral keys uh, rather than credentials. So if in uh, a classic world that we know of, if we want to store the username and password of the application user to the database, even if we know that there's only one server in one place that's ever going to need that, in Vault it doesn't work that way. You, never, you don't store a static secret uh, that you don't have to store. Rather, you configure Vault, you tell Vault, okay, this is the database server that you're going to be talking to. These are the roles on the database server. And these are the, this is the access control for each type of role. And when I, as a user, come and request access to the database server, Vault is going to go on my behalf, provision a one-time username and random username and random password, and give me that. And Vault will do as much as possible based on, uh, on the back end to ensure that each type of thing can be used um, once only. Uh, for people who are thinking, well, I have a lot of uh, static stuff like uh, uh, the, the, the private key for, uh, for a certificate that's sitting on my server that's not going to help, uh, no worries, Vault does do static stuff. Um, so we're going to do the first demo, if this works screen resolution wise. Uh, I set up a whole bunch of uh, Docker containers. And what we're going to do is we're going to show how we can log into a PostgreSQL server with Vault. Uh, this is using a custom uh, JDBC driver to connect to PostgreSQL. It's an open source fork of uh, the main PostgreSQL um, driver. It can be found at the end. You'll have a link to my LinkedIn. Uh, and you could see an article where I posted the, uh, the uh, link to the source code for the driver that we're using here. Uh, you can see that, well, I don't know how much you can see, but it looks, it looks kind of like a normal JDBC string for all, of the, uh, all of those who are familiar with it. You have a username and a password, and you have these extra variables here that have uh, a Vault host, a Vault username, uh, a Vault authorization path, and a Vault database path. We don't need to really understand the ins and outs of it, but let's, let's see what happens when we run this. Okay, I have two workbenches here. Okay, both of these authenticated using user test, like we saw before here, user test. And if we look at the current user here, 
we can see, can you guys see the users? The, so we have two different users. You can see this is YV. Right? I know it's not so clear, but it's clear enough to see that these are two different users, even though we use the exact same uh, connection. If we look a little bit closer at the PG user uh, table, the PG user is the, is the users table in PostgreSQL. We could see that we have three users. There's the default user that I created when I uh, brought up this database, which is Postgres, and here are my two temporary users. And if we look closer at these temporary users, we could see they have a valid util time, which by now has expired. If I bump it up, you could see that these have changed. So now it's 41.42 and 41.48. And if, uh, if I wait another 10 seconds and then refresh it, we'll see that these timestamps moved up, 58 and 02, okay? Lastly, if I close one of these connections, right, this is the one that, uh, that starts with YW. Uh, this will take a little bit longer, but uh, in the next 20 seconds or so, Vault will actually have cleaned up. There you go. Now there's only one, two users left in the table. We've lost uh, the, the temporary user, okay? What about auditing? We talked about auditing, so I have, let's see if I can break out of the PowerPoint here. Back to the demo slide. Okay, I have, I also brought up as part of the, the Docker thing up. Sorry, that's the password. <laughs> laugh at Elastic, don't laugh at me. I mean, this is the standard uh, blank <laughs> container for, for Docker and uh, for uh, for FileBeat and for uh, Kibana and for uh, Elasticsearch, okay? Now, let's say, let's say that I know from some logging that this database user here did some damage to the database. How do I know who that user is? How can I audit that user? So Vault has an audit log, as we said, that's gonna log everything. Uh, most, of the, most of the audit log is uh, human readable. Uh, sensitive things like usernames and passwords that uh, Vault knows up front are sensitive, aren't going to show up as clear text, they're going to be HMAC. Uh, luckily there's a tool that you could use if, if, if you know the HMAC and don't know the clear text, you're screwed. If you know the clear text, Vault will help you generate the HMAC you need. So let's look up the HMAC for this username. Okay, there's my HMAC. Let's close this so it doesn't keep adding entries to our uh, audit log. Okay, and I could find the things that talk about this HMAC here. Um, so for example, if this demo looks, works as well as all the practice ones, then this is gonna be the one that chose the login, all right? Here we could see that the request was to database creds Postgres. That was the REST endpoint that generated this, uh, this pair of credentials. I could see the, in the response, I have the lease ID. Remember we talked about the leases. This is the thing that could be extended and uh, when extended, it'll tell Postgres to also extend the, extend the user that we saw getting extended in the database, uh, the username and the password. And we have the client token. So for the client token, a lot of the metadata, that we have the auth the, this is the authentication that was used on this request. So we already have a lot of useful information here, but let's say, let's say we didn't have all the information that we wanted. Let's say we had something else uh, that, that showed up in the, we want to know what the IP of the uh, identity that, that uh, generated this client token was that logged into this. So I could look this up in Kibana. I want that and I want login. Hopefully I want to get one. Very good. Okay, and here I can actually see the actual login that was done. I have the, 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 the username, which is part of the path. I could see that it was uh, using the user pass, which is just the username and password uh, to authenticate. I could see that the username was test. If I knew what the password was, uh, I could look for all requests that were logged in using that password. I have the IP address. I have basically all the information. I also have the policies, which we'll get back to in a bit, 
uh, which shows what the user can do. I have a lot of rich information here that, uh, that in the case that I need to do a post-mortem, I could use to, uh, to do my homework. Right, and this all comes, this is like all very standard stuff involved. All right, so moving along. All right, I want to take a, I want to talk a little bit about the encryption model. I've been going on and on about how secure Vault is. We all know that uh, these secure systems uh, are certainly not any better than the encryption model that sits behind them, so how does it work? Vault has uh, two key rings. There's a, rather, there's a, uh, there's, let's start from the data. Data is encrypted at rest. All data that goes into Vault gets encrypted. That is done using a standard uh, encryption keyring, which is an internal keyring that Vault manages. There's no way from the outside uh, to get the proper way, right through proper channels to the encryption uh, to the encryption keyring. The encryption keyring is itself stored using a different encryption key, uh, and that key is called the master key. The master key is the one piece of information that's never uh, that's never committed to persistent storage. Um, when you create a new vault, uh, initialize a new uh, vault storage backend. You have to initialize the vault. Part of initializing the vault is that you create this master key. The master key can be sharded. It's sharded using Shamir's algorithm, which basically means Shamir's algorithm is a way of saying, given a, this uh, a, an amount, of, a block of data that's uh, x bytes, I want to I want to uh, shard that into a pieces where on, where B pieces are needed to create the entire key. So for example, I could set up the sharding so that uh, I make five shards, but any three shards together are enough to give me the encryption key, uh, the, the master key. And so what happens is when you start up the vault process, like the actual process in Linux Windows on an operating system that's running the vault, the first thing it's going to do is say, okay, I need volunteers to give me the, the bits of the master key. All I know is that I, I, I don't know too much about it. I just I need you guys to start feeding it in. And it's going to assume that, uh, at least in the open source version of, uh, of Vault, that you split it between several different individuals. How you manage this is really up to you. Uh, in general, you're going to want to make more than one shard. Uh, three out of five is something that I like in my Vault setups. It really depends on how many people uh, you plan on needing every time you start up a Vault instance because this is a very manual process, right? People who want to pay a lot of money, you can get and have a big fancy uh, hardware crypto device, can shell money to Vault and get an automated way of doing it, but most of us are not going to do it. Okay? Most of us are going to use the key shards, and that's a process called unsealing. When Vault starts, it's sealed. It has no way of getting the data because it doesn't know its own master key. You give it the shards. Vault be then becomes unsealed. It now has its master key, which it commits only to RAM. It also commits it to RAM that is not allowed to be paged to disk. Um, and that's the only copy of the key. Uh, this is also a great big red button. If you think something went wrong, any, uh, any Vault administrator can say, Vault, seal yourself. Uh, and then you're going to have to go through the entire unsealing ceremony to get to it. Another core concept I want to talk about uh, is authentication. Earlier we saw something about, uh, we saw the client token, right? That's um, this guy, this guy that we looked up before, right? So when you log into, uh, the token is the basic authentication unit or identity unit inside Vault. Any operation to Vault generally requires a token. When you log into Vault using some sort of challenge, username and password, or other ways that we'll get to later. Basically what's happening is you're presenting your credentials and similar to any web application, you get a token. Um, this could be based on the way you actually use Vault. This is, uh, is the, the tender underbelly. You need to protect the token. These tokens uh, are static, they're renewable, they're switchable. There are a lot of things that you could do to make them that, uh, that dynamic, but by their nature, Aside from the least time in the TTL, they're static. So if anyone does a man in the middle and grabs the token, you're screwed. You want to make sure it doesn't happen. Vault is going to help make sure it doesn't happen. If we have time, I'll get into some concepts about uh, features that Vault gives to make it really easy. But if you consider that everything is connecting to Vault through HTTPS, uh, and if we're considering a world where once a, a, a 
person or a thing authenticates the vault and has its token, that token can be considered a secret key. Uh, secret keys are static, they never change. They don't normally even have TTL. So, you know, as much as I'm warning you guys about it, this isn't an unmanageable thing. This is just something that, uh, as a potential vault operator, you, got, you need to be aware of when you're planning about uh, how you're going to do it. Uh, these tokens have leases attached to it. These tokens also, if we remember earlier, we talked about a lease, can have things chained underneath it. So this token, if you log in, if I log in as user Isaac to my vault, and then I go and I get a database credential and I get an SSH key pair and I get a whole bunch of other things, the moment I log out um, a vault, all of those credentials that I have in dynamic places will be revoked on the spot by vault. Vault will clean everything up for me. ACLs. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about this. We saw, there, we, we saw also attached to every user is a list of policies. For example, this user we have has the default policy and has the Postgres policy. The way that policies work in, uh, in Vault is that we have a list of ACLs. Everything is REST endpoints, right? So Vault defines seven permissions, create, update, read, list, delete, sudo, and deny. Um, and Vault defines policies. A policy is a named list of ACLs that say, for this policy, uh, these permissions should be set on this endpoint. Uh, by default, Vault is in deny mode. So unless you uh, explicitly give permission to do something, you won't have permission to do it. Uh, when you log into Vault, when you do that authentication, one of the things that Vault's going to do is it's going to ha have a mapped list of policies for your username that it will attach to the token and the lease that, that you're connected to. And that's how Vault does um, uh, access control policies. Am I on time? Does anyone remember what I'm supposed to finish? Yeah? So I have time. All right, we'll try, we'll try to do another demo and hopefully this won't backfire on me. So in this demo, I want to uh, quickly look at the, uh, the, the static secrets and I want to look at the REST API. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to log in with curl and get a different token. Up until now, uh, on this Docker image, I've basically been doing everything as root inside of Vault. Uh, that's not how we usually do it. So here, as you can see, I'm running curl uh, I'm posting a file called auth.json, which we'll look at in a second, and I'm sending that uh, on HTTP because it's a local setup. You usually use HTTPS to v1 auth user pass uh, login test, which means I'm logging in as user test. Okay, that uh, the the user file is a JSON file. It has the username and the password, uh, and Vault uh, Vault gets it and spits out a client token. We saw this HMAC earlier. This is the token that I'm going to use to do anything else that I want to do on Vault. Um, I have uh, the policies. I have metadata. The username is test. There's not a lot of metadata because I'm using a simple username and password store. There are other stores that we're, we'll get to soon that could decorate this uh, a lot better. Uh, and I have a lease duration. I'm not sure if you can see it. I can't see it. Um, I can't see it now either. But you guys will trust me that under this lease duration, there is a time to live. That's how long the username could live. I also see that it's renewable. I could have set it so that this is a one-time token and the token can't renew itself. Uh, usually a token will, you'll want to let a token renew itself so that you can keep the login uh, going. And this is a really uh, useful thing, especially with when you have um, serverless things or spot instances or containers, all these modern computing terms that refer to systems that you expect could possibly disappear at any given moment. So what, how do you revoke them? It's very easy. You give these guys low, uh, low latency uh, TTLs inside of Vault, and you simply have a local process that periodically renews it, and it'll keep the token working. And then if the process or machine or container or whatever disappears, within the TTL time, it'll expire. All the leases will expire. Everything's been nice and cleaned up. Uh, no dirty mess to worry about. So here I got a client token. Now I'm going to try to use, I'm going to try to, uh, I didn't put anything there yet, so I'm going to write. Vault write uh, secret foo value equals bar. Okay, now I could read. Remember, I'm reading now as user root. 
So I can, from the command line interface, I could see, I could see that the value equals var. I could see there's a refresh interval. I don't really have a lease because this is a static token and Vault knows that it's static, but it gives me this advisory. This is what the lease that should be configured for this endpoint. I hope you'll respect it. Uh, and if I wanted to get that from curl, I'd get a permission denied. Why would I get a uh, permission denied? Because in this batch file that I have set up uh, on purpose, I have the vault token that was used. I have this vault token, which is not the same as this vault token. Why? Because this is what I had last time I did the demo for myself in front of a mirror while I was shaving this morning. No. Um, if we set it to use the right one, If I use the right token, now I have, uh, I can see that the data equals bar. This is the JSON. This is exactly what it appears uh, as, uh, and that's how Vault works. Uh, for a last example that we can see something um, that uses a dynamic lease, let's try to get the credentials for Postgres. Let's see if I remember where it lives. That's what happens when I close my command window by accident. Let's just do it this way. All right. So when I read from it now, I get a lease ID, I get a lease duration. This is a lease that's actually going to be backed by Vault that Vault is, is going to manage. Uh, I, I can see that the lease itself is renewable. Uh, remember, the lease is only as renewable as, my, as the token is, unless I've told Vault to do otherwise. And here's the, user, the, pass, the username that we saw earlier, and this is the type of uh, random password that we get from Vault. Moving on ahead, I will stop for questions, I promise, in just another slide or so. Um, the meat and potatoes of Vault. Vault is a modular system, uh, pluggable. Uh, these are the list of backends that you have built into it. There are three types of backends, modules, plugins, whatever you want to call them. They're not plugins. There are, there, are, there are plugins. These are not plugins. These are the built in. Okay, you have authentication backends, you have audit backends, you have secret backends. We'll start with audit because it's the fast list. There are only three of them. You could write to a local file, you could write to a TCP or UDP socket, or you could write to the rsyslog facility. Uh, and those three basically cover most of the use cases that you have today. Like uh, with the, the Kibana example that we saw here, I was just using a file uh, and it was being sent with uh, file beats to Elasticsearch and everything worked really nicely. So this is really all that you need. Very simple. Authentication backends. I like to break these authentication backends into two types. Uh, types that are um, targeted for humans and types that are targeted for machines. So on the human side, we have user pass, which is username and password. That's what we've been doing here. For larger organizations, you have LDAP, uh, you have RADIUS, uh, you have TLS client certificates, so each user can have a, uh, a private key and you can authenticate with, uh, with HTTPS uh, client certificates to get a, a token. Uh, you could use open ID like um, stuff. I'm sure that at some point there's gonna be normal open ID support. For now, there's GitHub. Uh, there's MFA, which isn't really a backend, but rather it's a helper on a backend. Uh, currently, if you go with the open source version of Vault, the only uh, MFA you have is uh, Duo, uh, Duo Security, which will give you this really cool push, uh, push notification to uh, SMS or to your mobile device or to whatever. Uh, and you could use that in conjunction with the username, the user pass, LDAP, and Radius. Um, there's much cooler uh, support in the enterprise version of Vault. So if you need that, you should get it. And if you get it because I told you that, that it's really cool, you should tell the people at HashiCorp that uh, I recommended it and they should give me a license so I could talk about all the cool stuff that I simply can't talk about because I can't afford it on my own dime. Uh, so for machine, there are, uh, there are its own set of backends. First of all, first and foremost, there's a token. Remember, the tokens are static strings. Uh, so there could be setups where you, as an operator, you want to, uh, to, to, to actually request the token and put the token in a closed environment and just keep using that token without authenticating uh, in a meaningful way. 
Uh, you also have AppRoll, which is very similar to username and password. You basically have two secrets. Uh, and the idea is that the two secrets should come from two different channels. So for example, if I was provisioning a mach uh, machine with Chef that lived on AWS, I would put one half of the secret in, uh, in as part of the Chef recipe that it would sit on the machine. And another part of the secret, when I went to AWS and I created the machine, I put it in the user data or a tag or something. Um, the idea being that there should be two separate processes that generate the thing because you don't want to give any one person access to both uh, halves of the secret and they could uh, they can authenticate themselves. Uh, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud each have uh, built-in support with Vault so that uh, an instance, a compute instance on either of those platforms can, um, can authenticate itself to Vault. Uh, and Kubernetes also, uh, there's been some support done in Kubernetes, so uh, a container running on Kubernetes can authenticate as that container to Vault. Uh, as far as secret backends, uh, there, there are two, really two, but we'll, we'll make them three types of secret backends. We'll start with the static ones. Static is what we saw with the food equals bar. We have the secret backend, which is simple static. It goes in, it gets committed to disk, encrypted, uh, and you could read it out later. You also have what's called cubbyhole, which I don't know if I'll have time to get to, but you can do a lot of really interesting things with cubbyhole. Cubbyhole is the same as secret, but a cubbyhole is attached to a token. So as soon as the token expires, the entire cubbyhole disappears. Um, and that, that gives us a lot of cool stuff like response wrapping, which I may or may not have time to get to later, uh, but really interesting ways that how you could transport data through untrusted relays uh, using that. Uh, and the third type of uh, static backend is what's called the transit backend, which is basically plug-in encryption. Uh, Vault doesn't actually store the data in the database, in the, in the storage. Uh, you send it, it goes, it encrypts it as if it was going to write it to disk, and it sends you back the encrypted block. You could encrypt data that way, and you could decrypt data that way, and the endpoints are, uh, are protected by the normal policies, and the key rings are managed the same way that, any, that, that Vault's internal key rings are managed. Dynamic, the dynamic backends, the dynamic backends. The dynamic backends are the fun ones, like the database one that you saw before. Uh, so there are a lot of there's a lot of database support. You have support for MySQL, for Cassandra, uh, for MongoDB, for Console, uh, which is their KV store, uh, MSSQL, PostgreSQL, uh, Redshift uh, through a plugin. Uh, plugins came out. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna have time to talk about them. About them later, so I'll just say for a minute now. Plugins came out earlier this summer, and I jumped on them. I've been waiting for a year and a half for plugins to come, and I said, "Okay, I'm going to make a plugin uh, for Redshift because Redshift is just different enough from PostgreSQL that it doesn't work." Uh, so you have support for that. Also, it's an open source plugin. Um, RabbitMQ, SSH. SSH is really cool. It's the same idea that you have uh, with with the, with the databases, except that it's a physical machine. There's actually a Vault SSH command. You say vault SSH into this machine, and it'll use your token, authenticate the vault, see if it can get a username and password for the machine. If so, vault will SSH into the machine uh, as a privileged user, add a system user with the privileges that was defined on the remote machine, give you the username and password, and you'll log into that machine uh, all from the comfort of your uh, CLI. Uh, so that's really po uh, powerful. AWS, if you, uh, AWS has this idea of, uh, of uh, short-lived tokens to do uh, um, a set of authenticated requests against AWS, and you could use that uh, also. The last on the list of dynamic ones is TOTP. Uh, so if you want to set up your own uh, MFA for your own app, uh, Vault has its own uh, virtual TOTP. Uh, which is a time-based, it's the, for people who use MFA with those six-digit codes that you see on most of the web, uh, web pages, that's TOTP. Vault can manage the secret key and public keys to, to help you do your own thing on your own site. Uh, you can do as many as you want. Um, the last one that I want to talk about, which is my favorite for some reason, I don't know why, is the PKI interface, thank you. The PKI interface basically means that you could run your own uh, certificate authority. So this is really useful even today, but it was, it, was a lot more useful years ago before Kubernetes and these other uh, uh, Docker um, orchestration frameworks came out. Because Docker, if you want to do uh, authenticate to Docker, that's all done using uh, not username and passwords, but rather certificates, which are a pain in the rear end to manage. 
So with Vault, you can actually manage these CAs. Uh, you could request a certificate or you can uh, create your own CSR and send it to Vault to be signed. You could mount as many of these PKIs in a single Vault instance as you want in parallel. Uh, and then you could have you know, your top level CA, your intermediate CA. Uh, there's no way to get the private keys for the CAs out of Vault. You have one chance to get them out, which is when you generate it. And after that, they're all securely uh, stored by Vault. Um, so there's another bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about. I'm not going to have time. Uh, response wrapping and plugins. So we'll just go straight to uh, Q&A. How much time do I have for questions? Yeah? All right. So questions, yeah? So the question was uh, for, for authorization, if there was a plugin system on that, uh, you, you, can, you, can you extend the list of the seven permissions that I, that I mentioned earlier on the ACLs? Uh, the answer is no, there isn't. If you have a use case for it, uh, Vault is on GitHub. Definitely post a question and, um, and, and come to me because I'd love to hear it also. I haven't found a use case for it yet. Any other questions? All right. I guess we'll end early. We'll give you guys an extended coffee break rather than me starting another topic that I want to have time to finish. Thank you so very much. As a reminder, if you liked what you heard, there are going to be surveys given to you all later. Please rate the session well if you love me and you want to see me again. And if you don't, come and talk to me about it in private. <laughs>